everyone, it's Tuesday and I am coming to you from California where it is rainy, rainy, rainy. I came out here with my family this week and we knew it was gonna be rainy so we did a boat tour yesterday where we looked at whales and that's why I'm so red. Y'all, I didn't even think about the sun reflecting up off the water. So hopefully I'll be a little bit more normal color by the time next week rolls around. Anyways, we've got a great show for you today. I've gone through and I've picked out a collection of questions that have come in over the course of the last several years and I've put them together into a very special program for you to watch today. So maybe you've seen some of these, but the majority of them, I'm guessing you either have forgotten about or haven't seen at all. And if you stay till the end, I've got some very special footage that uh, David Scholl has sent in from Australia with all of the mule uh, work that he's doing down in the land down under. Now, don't forget we've got our Montana event coming up this June. You can go to uh, muleranch.com and you'll see an invitation right there for the Montana clinic. And Steve is going to be in Tennessee this fall, come September, October. So go ahead, uh, check out both of those clinics available on the muleranch.com website. And it sure would be great to see you there. So, okay, let's get into the program. And remember, if you stay till the very end, there's some very special footage of what David Scholl is doing with his mules, all these young yearlings that he's got in Australia. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Uh, Lisa says, hello from Oregon. Hello, Lisa. I have an almost one and a half year old Molly uh, who I've had since about five months old. She is sweet and friendly. I can brush her all over, pick her feet, pick up her feet, uh, roach her mane, and uh, so on. But she doesn't understand personal space at times. Just loves to be touched, groomed, rubbed down. Still will try to walk right through me at times like I'm not there. How do I get her to stop this? I put my elbows up in her face and she will stop any tips. Well, the come along hitch is absolutely the best way to go. Understand that they need to understand that this is my space, this is your space. You are not allowed to come into my space, but I am allowed to come into your space. So the come along hitch will build a foundation of this is my space. Now, let's just say you don't have the come along hitch. The mule comes into your space. She says, hey, pet me, scratch me, be around me. Well, unfortunately, you created a monster. OK, so but you can still fix it. So when she comes into your space, you don't have your come along rope. You can also take the edge of your foot and tap with the edge of your boot against her cannon bone. And that'll make her uncomfortable. Now, you can also kick a little dirt toward her, you know, and, and that'll stop. I'll tell you, I was over in, uh, in Minnesota uh, at, the, uh, at the zoo there in Minnesota, and I had a couple of uh, big Percheron mules that were mucking out all the handlers. And so, uh, they said, what do we do? They, they come in during feeding time and they've stepped on people, they've hurt them and they've knocked the feet out of their hands, the whole bit. So, so all the handlers are watching, uh, some of the managers are watching, and here's these two big Pertron mules out there. I come walking up with the grains of feed and I'm shaking those grains saying, come on, come on, and here they come. Well, when they come <coughs> toward me, I kick some dirt toward them. And when, it, when I kicked the dirt toward them, they stopped and they looked like, why did you, what, what happened here, you know? So while they're looking, I'm pouring the bucks, buckets of feed into their feeders. And if they looked back up, I kicked dirt back toward them. See, that changed their mind, uh, just that kick in the dirt toward them, which, which just might be a thought. But the biggest thing you can do with a baby at a year and a half is do your come along work, do your groundwork, that ground communication uh, Kit, uh, Dave, is most important. Next question. This one came in from Julie. She says, my husband purchased a mule about two months ago. It's a Henny gelded about three years old. Drives quiet nicely, but could use some ground manners. Don't we all need a little bit of ground manners? Have had horses, but never a mule. I have been watching lots of the training videos, and I'm wondering, is there any difference in training a Henny because of his more horse-like features? Thank you for any information or resources that you can give me on this subject. We get a lot of questions about Hennies, Steve. Um, what is a Henny, and then is there any difference in how you're going to train a Henny versus a standard? Okay, so a Henny, the mother is the donkey, and the father is the horse, where with the standard mule, 
the father is the donkey and the mother is the horse. There's no difference. You can put two mules together, two of them together and say one of them's a henny. And people will say, oh, he's got smaller ears, smaller head. No, no, no. Has nothing to do with it. Still the same bone structure because we still have the donkey involved. So there's no difference with ears, head, body, the way it's built. No difference. The only way you can tell it is a henny is when you do a DNA test. Only way. There ain't no other way. You may, you may think and see. But it's not, folks. I've had, literally, I've had a clinic, Dave, where we've had a henny and we've had a mule. And I would say to the folks, which one is the henny? And it was inevitable. The horse, the mule with the smaller head and the smaller ears, everybody thought was a henny. Nope, it was the mule. So that's the only way you could tell. So training-wise, I train donkeys, horses, mules, all using the same way of training what are some of the things that when folks are putting that putting that saddle on top of the mule assuming that they've got the right saddle that they go wrong with some of the adjustments where are some of the things that maybe they've seen some other folks do or they've seen on a horse that need to be different when it comes to to fitting their mule well one of the biggest things that i have all the time is people are always worried about that back cinch oh that back cinch is it's liable to make him buck. Well, folks, there's a ring back there, and it's on the majority of saddles except for the English saddles. And English saddles don't work on these mules, but that's another story. That back ring is a reason, uh, has a reason. That front ring has a reason. You'll notice a lot of horses, a lot of mules, they have white spots up on that scapula. Why is that? Because what they do is they tighten the front cinch, and then the back of the saddle comes up because they don't have the rear cinch down, the rear cinch down. And so when they sit on it, the saddle is doing this cantilevering. So one of the first things I notice, people, great thing about this, this new digital series, people send me pictures of their mules and they say, hey, Steve, how does this saddle look? How does the breaching look? Do I need to adjust this? And I can look at that picture and say, do this, do this, and this, click it, line it up, it makes it nice. But the biggest problem is people are trying to take my saddle and trying to make it into what they know of works, saddle, horse saddle. They'll put a breast collar on it. If you notice on my saddle, there's no rings for a breast collar like a horse because what happens is every time that, that shoulder hits that breast collar, it makes that saddle come forward. So they're trying to use their gear, their horse gear, keyword horse, to try to make Save a few bucks, and I understand the saving a few bucks things, but I ask them all the time, go out and have your mule walk around and, and, and measure your saddle to start with from the scapula to the edge of the bar and go out 15 minutes, you'll see that saddle will move almost a half an inch. A lot of reasons for it, but because they use their horse breast collar, every time the shoulder hits that breast collar, it brings the saddle forward. So, no rear cinch, horse breast collar, you know. Oh, I got a breaching on it, Steve. The breaching is going to pretty soon start rubbing against that animal, and you're going to cuss the breaching because that breaching is rubbing his hair off. It's not the breaching's problem. It's the front cinch being too tight and the back cinch not being there. So it's cantilevering, inching its way forward. It's one of the biggest things that I see drives me crazy to see pictures on the internet, Facebook and this sort of thing, one cinch and the back of that saddle looking like a stink bug going down the road. So biggest problem, only a front cinch tight, horse breast collar, that's the two main things. Let me give you one last thing. You know, there's a reason that the underneath of that saddle is a wool, or in my case, I don't use real wool. I use synthetic for another reason. That is because they would take their their saddles, throw them on, cinch them down, and go off. They wouldn't have saddle pads and blankets. But they did start putting blankets underneath the saddle so that they'd have something to lay on when they were out there underneath the stars. There it is. So people want to use wool. Oh, read what it says 
on their information about that pad. It whisk away the moisture. It's taking what's the natural way for that animal to stay cool, natural way for him to lubricate, and the wetter that blanket, that pad is, the wetter it is underneath there, the better it is, you know. And so people all the time are saying, gee, my saddle goes forward. Well, that wool is slick. Oh, we did a video, didn't we? We did. On that. Yeah, and, and, and you can see people holding on to the saddle pad and pushing the saddle right off. Yep. Then they take my saddle and my pad and try to push it off and they can't do it, you know. And so I ask people all the time, why spend $250 for a wool pad that you've got to, you've got to cut your mule in half to make it stick, you know. So, you know, I, I, I just, I'm going to transform the mule and donkey world one mule at a time. Jacqueline says, just got your saddle, pad, britchin, and trail rider bit for the bridle. Kind of discouraged yep. to hear that now need to train with Sir Single and Martingale for six months before even trying to ride her. Any people out there had better luck when they buy a supposedly well-trained mule? That's, okay, so Jacqueline, like that, don't, don't be, dis that is discouraging. Here's the mm -hmm. thing. That's not unique to you. One of the things that, no. that um, I'm just going to be frank, um, listening to what Adrian was saying, uh, she said, I've had her for about two months and I started rising, riding her, but I'm afraid I will lose control. And that's the reason why we go through the things the way that we do. It's not because we've come up with some arbitrary way, some arbitrary process, but it's because the last thing you want to do is get into the saddle with a quote unquote well-trained mule and find out that you can't have control when you need it. And so this is all preventative work and there's never a safe mule and there's never a safe ride and there's never a trained mule, but there is foundation. And that's what we're working to do here is build that foundation. So when the moment comes that the mule decides he wants to blow up, you know what to do to communicate and the mule has a foundation to respond. Pretty much correct, Steve? Yeah, that's great. It's great. It's like Mr. O'Brien there. Look at his year and a half old coat, you know. And really, folks, six months will go by so, by so fast it'll blow you away. You're only talking four to six hours a week. And what this, other, what this thing does as well is it builds your confidence, okay? Builds your confidence. I see all these videos uh, on these auction sites and stuff that people have going to have coming up. And just look at them, folks. They're horses under a mule costume that's all they are okay they're using horse techniques they don't know no better i wouldn't think but just look at where the saddles are saddles are on top of the scapula look at them there's no breaching on them okay this is not a horse this is a mule a mule and because of the way a mule is made you have to put a breaching on you have to have the wrist inch type so when you're going to these auction sites or you're going online and you're looking at these different animals, you know, a lot of these folks don't have the knowledge. They don't know. OK, so now here's here's what here's what you got to think about. And to be honest with you is that is that, you know, they're only giving you their knowledge of what they know is going on with the meal. There could be some underlying problems there that you're not aware of, that they're not aware of. And they show up when you go to get in the saddle. Or they show up when you go to load them in a the trailer. Or they show up when you start to pick up a foot. All that stuff, folks. That's why you've got to get yourself with a bunch of information. Arm yourself with information. Arm yourself. Don't just watch me. Watch other people out there and decide, okay, <clears throat> I got this idea. I got this idea. I see this work. I see this don't work. And arm yourself with ammunition. Then when you go to buy a meal, boom, boom, boom. Or... When you bought the mule and now you got to pay the price of fixing the mule, boom, boom, boom. So folks, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. I want you to be safe. I've got lots of ideas here of things that I've done over the years that work, that are consistent. And, and like I told you before, if they don't work, don't use them. Okay. But you're going to find that my 50 some years there is going to help you. And the other thing, just ask anybody. I'll help you. You call me, hey, Steve, I'm having a hard time sitting in the saddle and my butt hurts, okay? Well, I'm going to help you with that. Hey, Steve, da, 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 whatever it may be, 
Let me help you out. Um, so I had a question come in from PH over on YouTube and PH was watching our video on communicating with an honorary mule. And one of the things that he didn't get was um, why you would be yanking on the come along rope or the rope halter. He says it seems like you're just trying to get a reaction. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up the video on YouTube and I'm going to let you talk through it here real quick. So let me get the video here. All right, so there's the video, and do you remember this? You remember this animal? Oh yeah. What are we looking at here, Steve? Okay, the mule is right there, wanting to wanting to pull away from him. There's a hip lock right there. The mule is not wanting to come along when I ask him to. All of a sudden, blows up. Okay, and when he does, I simply tell him by sharp bump. That that's incorrect. Notice I'm just bumping, bumping, keeping him straight. Remember, I, I talked about straightness. There's straightness. There's straightness. There's straightness. When the mule is incorrect, I bump it. My timing, folks, is 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 what you have to have. That was the proper timing. Let's go back and back it up again, Dave. In the very beginning. Okay, before it was dragging my apprentice around. You see that? He was dragging my apprentice around. You see that? Yeah. He was dragging my apprentice. Now, notice I hip lock it, and that keeps that mule from getting away from me. It's a hip lock. You see that? That mule has gone bonkers. He's out of control. And it happens. Notice I'm bumping. I'm bumping. I'm bu There. See? Now I got the feet quiet. Notice the rope is loose. Notice the rope is loose now. I give him a chance. He wanted to blow up. He wanted to go everywhere. And now it's loose. Now his feet are standing still and quiet. And notice the straightness. Notice the mule is straight. And I bump it and ask him to come over. And I just wanted a small step. And he wanted to throw his head around. So I give him a sharp little bump. I said, nope, I want your feet quiet. Now... I'm gonna wait, I want your feet quiet. Notice the lead rope is loose. I'm giving him a chance to make a mistake, okay? I'm talking to my apprentice, now I'm asking the mule to come forward, a step at a time, not when he wants to. Notice the hip lock again. All I asked for was a small step, a small step, a small step. Instead, the mule wanna blow up. So see, folks, I'm trying to keep it small. Notice I'm rolling my wrist, rolling my wrist, rolling my wrist, <coughs> rolling my wrist, keeping it small, keeping the mule straight. And then the mule blows up, I go after him. Let's go back again, Dave. Go back to the very beginning again. Okay, the mule is dragging my apprentice around. Now he wants to drag me around. You see that? The mule is blowing up. This ain't me. The mule is blowing up. I'm trying to keep the mule from blowing up. And I'm hip locking right there. Hip locking. Bang. He comes to the end of the rope. He, his nose pays the price. I'm hip locking. Notice he's trying to get away from me. This isn't me doing this. This is the mule blowing up. Now, you see? The mule finally goes, oh, man. That, I wasn't getting nowhere. My thought was flight and fright. Your thought is to stand still. Notice his nose is flaring. Notice he's he's standing still and quiet. Okay. His heart was pounding, but his nose started getting sore. And notice now the rope is loose. Now a small little bump. I'm just rolling my wrist. I want some small little steps. Notice the straightness. Now I'll I'll I'm holding the rope loose. I'm allowing the mule to make a mistake. If he'll make a mistake then I'll fix it. Otherwise, I'll let him stand still and quiet. I'll wait till he makes a mistake. Now I roll my wrist. I want a small step. Instead, the mule blows up. So my small step didn't work. Now I come back and I ask for a small step again. Small little steps. The mule wants to blow up. He's going to get it. Small step. Small step. Small step. Small step. Notice that I give him a chance, the rope is loose, 
tightens back up again. But every time now he's listening, I've gone from a demanding stage of a hip lock to where I can roll my wrist. Go back again, Dave. I want you all to see the timing that you've got to have. The, the mule was dragging this little girl. She didn't weigh 90 pounds soft and wet, not even that. And notice that the mule, the mule is doing this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through all this. The mule is blowing up. The mule is blowing up. Boom, boom, boom. This is one of my apprentices at the ranch. The mule is blowing up. The mule wants to go there. But my timing tells that mule that all this time I was rolling my wrist, bumping my wrist while I was hip locking. Notice the mule finally decided my nose is sore. Notice his nose is flaring. He said, my mistake, I was doing what I thought was natural and that it was flight and flight, flight because of fright. And I showed him that his nose is gonna be sore when he makes mistakes. Notice I asked for a small movement Watch for the small movement. And then if he doesn't do it correct, I bump him. So I've gone from major down to rolling my wrist. Slow and easy. Folks, this is what a come along rope can do with you. But you see, it's my timing. It's my timing. You have to get your timing. Notice I'm rolling my wrist. Roll, and the mule wants to blow up. Okay, it didn't do no good. What happened? Wasn't near so bad that time. You see that? A lot easier that time. Now I roll my wrist, roll my wrist. My mule says, I want to pay attention. When he's incorrect, I'm going to bump him. Are you trying right here? Let me rewind it. Are you trying to get him to take a step and stop? Take a step and stop? Or Yes. Okay. So right here, step. Now stop. Yes. Okay. Step and stop. See, I want to control the feet, and the come along hitch does that, okay? This mule was a possophino mule. It was an idiot, no brains, okay? Uh, they, they were paying this uh, apprentice. She was going through my apprenticeship program, and they were paying her to train the mule, but we're paying for her training. Now watch now. Now I'm coming out. Notice small steps, small steps. And when the mule makes a mistake, bump, 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 bump. Notice, wasn't so bad that time. Now I come back and ask it again. Small step. Small step. I'm rolling my wrist, rolling my wrist, rolling my wrist. Notice better. Notice how much better this time. Notice better. There. You see? That's number two. The mule was literally plowing her through that gate. Plowing her through that gate. But notice the come along hitch one. But notice two folks, it's my timing. Your timing needs to be there, okay? It's the come along rope is gonna be as good as you, period. If I was that person in that cart, in that pony cart, I got we got video of a cart blowing up, you know? Matter of fact, with, with this little gal here and, the, and the, the donkey was blowing up, you know? Well, the come along hitch fixed it. Now notice, I'm trying to get him to stand still and quiet. It's all small movements. Now the mule's wanting to kind of, there, quiet, good, quiet. See, now small movements, that's a backup. Swinging it right, left for a backup. He wants to blow up, okay, blow up. Try it again, back up. Now, try it again. You're gonna get him to stand still first, there. There, notice the length of rope there. <clears throat> notice that length of rope. That's my leverage. I'm asking right, left. Now down, 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 back up, back up there. Now I got to back up. You see all right, that? all right, all right. You got to right you got to do this one more time. So what are we trying to do here? Because I don't get it. I'm trying to get the mule to back up. See, so I'm going, watch this, right, left. Now down, boom, boom, boom. Now the mule backs up a step or two. Not How correct. is the down action getting him to go back? That because it puts pressure on the nose and they want to get away from that pressure. Okay. And so they will naturally back up. Now, okay, got go it. Go back through the gate again. You remember how the gate, the mule blew up going through the gate. Nice and quiet, nice and quiet. Good. Now it wants to blow up again. Now he got quiet again. 
blow up again, got quiet again. Talk about one with with not wanting to to get along with you. There you are. Was it the Boy, gate that he was freaking out over, or was he just freaking out over everything? He just he just wanted an excuse to not have to work. Okay. He's a Democrat. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> uh, okay, watch. He's going to come to the gate closer, quieter this time. Nope, oh, then he blew up. All right, now we'll go back again. Let's go back again. Through the corral, through the gate, close. See, he just doesn't like the idea of, of going through that gate. It's scary for him. Watch him. Watch him. He's going to blow up again. Bump, bump, bump. He's going to do anything at all but what I want him to do. There. There. Quieter. 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 Now we will come back again. I give him a little pet and say, good job. That's what we're looking for. <coughs> Eric, uh, Cindy Wheeler sent in a message about a uh, hackamore. She says, I have a stout mule bought as a ranch mule, packs and drives, and mounted shooting out of Texas. Told me they were using a hackamore. Haven't used them yet. Bonding with them now. Do you have any suggestions for me? Uh, I've actually talked to Miss Wheeler. Uh, they were in a vehicle going down the road, so we couldn't get a lot done, but they had the hands-free thing. Here's the thing with a mechanical hackamore. Mules care more about their nose than their mouth, and it's an awesome tool. Awesome tool. I use them a lot. Again, it's the same thing. Two fingers above the nostrils where I start my adjustment, and I work my way up. But here's the downside. If you just throw that on there, and that mule isn't well trained, doesn't have a good solid foundation. And what I mean by that is this. If you can ride 80% off of your legs, you can ride in a hackamore. Now, the other thing is, I do not stay in a hackamore all the time. I just put that mechanical hackamore on there, and I, and I put it on there so that the mule will get freshened up. I'll probably ride it several rides throughout a month, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but the downside is, is most folks end up pulling too much on it. They end up making the mule brace, and you end up with more problems. So when you're riding on a mechanical hackamore, you're going to ride light. Ride light. Now, there's a mechanical hackamore that uses leverages right here, and then there's a hackamore called a bozales, bozal, B-O-S-A-L, and it's kind of a teardrop shape. All right, and that's a wonderful tool to having a, a mule be really refined. I mean, you want one to drop and spin, pull out that, that bozal, you know. But yes, folks, use that mechanical hackamore. I've designed one. I've not sold one in a long time. Rainsman makes all of my equipment, like everything else I've got, it's all American made. And I've got a hackamore that I need to probably get back on the, uh, on the store again. And it's a wonderful thing. I do not ride in a rope halter. I can't tell you how many people I know that have been in rope halters and gotten jackpots and gotten wrecked. Uh, I knew one uh, packer up in Montana. He rode bridleless and rode with a, with a rope halter sometime. A bear come on the trail and he couldn't stop him. He ended up with a lot of broken bones. I am. Uh, we do have uh, the, the mechanical hackamore. Is that the one you were referring to? So yes. Got, yeah, I, I've got that. I'm putting in the comments section right now. It's up on the website. Um, so I just added it there. Sharon Graham, she says, uh, my new mule does not like to be alone. He will leave my other mule if I go out the gate. But when he first got here, he would mow you down if you took his buddy away. His behavior was horrendous in the hauler's trailer alone. When he arrived, he would not lead at all on my property. He stood like a post. I found some mule articles that worked fine. He's doing much better and I can now lead him with the rope dangling over my shoulder out back. 2.5 acres and out of my gain, no problem. I have saddled him and ridden him once since he arrived. I do something with him every other day, tie him to a tree. I'm very rural here. The previous dealer rode him with a uh, Dutton bit. What's my next step? I really like this mule. He is a very loving individual. Once you get past his fears, he's very respectful. Sharon. Yeah, and, and fears are, folks, it, that again goes back to disposition. It's Everybody thinks, oh, he's been beat on or he's been hurt. But a lot of them are just flat fearful. It's that side, the horse side, that seems to be, to me, more fearful because I've rarely seen it in, in the donkey. Uh, but uh, what's, what's the next step is to do more than just tie him. 
Uh, I suggest taking a surcingle, putting a surcingle on them, putting a rope halter on them, put them out in a round pen, let them go. Do not put them in a two and a half acres. Do not put them in an acre. Do put them in a 20 by 20 stall. If they're out there, they don't need you. So you need to be doing that. And if you and you have to properly adjust the rope halter. Uh, the rope halter is going to be a super important tool. So sir singling with a rope halter. And then when they start framing themselves up and balance themselves out, sir single with the, with the Mule Riders Martin. Is just going to start getting them to think about their communication with the halter. It's going to think about their communication when it comes down to the bit. And the same thing with Lynn, with her donkey. She needs to put the sur single on, put the rope halter on, turn them loose in a round pin, and let them get soft. The big problem is, is these kind of animals that have learned to get around you, and, and especially if a trader has just got it and bought it from someplace and went from there, uh, you, you, you need to start over and build a new foundation, you know. Uh, and that sur single does it. Now, sur single is a wonderful tool. Even if you've got a trained animal, what it does is it keeps them tuned up. Uh, and that, we've got some stuff on YouTube about that. And, of course, the sur singles are on my store. Yeah, I love the breast collar system. I've been fighting the saddle moving forward ever since I got my first mule, and this seems to have fixed it. And you had said, hey, uh, we can use this on Wednesday. What did you want to talk about as it related to Chris there? Well, you know, Dave, everybody that comes to mules, I'm not saying everybody, I'm going to say 95% of the people that have come to mules, that come to start riding mules and seeing how great they are, have already been riding horses. Just about everybody starts out with the email. Steve, I've been riding horses for 97 years, da 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 Okay? Okay, good. That means you've been around an equine. Now, that's number one. Next thing is you have a tack room full of tack. You've got bridles, you've got cinches, you got all that stuff. And I understand you spend a lot of money for that stuff. But just like my friend here, here he is. And I've you've heard me tell you before, you can't use horse equipment on a mule. Mules walk different. They have different bone structures. They have a different stage of mind. When you ride a mule, folks, you're riding a horse, a donkey, and a mule. You are. So now here he is with his horse breast collar. And he keeps saying, my saddle keeps going forward. My saddle keeps going forward. Okay. Number one, the mule will, because of the way they're made, they're V-shaped in their shoulders, where horses are A-shaped in their shoulders. That saddle is going to go forward. A wither makes no difference at all on a mule. Makes no difference. You put a, a saddle up on a wither, on a mule, you put the saddle up too far. Now, let's go to the next thing. Mules are very, very lateral when they're walking. So as they walk, they've got a very nice walk, very easy to go. So that tells me that we're done with that accident that was out there. Let's go to the next thing. When the mules are already built like that, already V-shaped in their shoulders, that saddle wants to go forward. And then when you take and you over tighten that front cinch, remember that front cinch? It's at an angle. The back cinch is straight up and down. So what's this? What's the saddle doing? It's being pulled forward by that front cinch. And then you take and put a horse breast collar on it at the same time. If you'll notice, none of my saddles have rings for a breast collar, for a horse breast collar. Then when people put them down on the D-ring, now the breast collar is way down here. And every time the shoulder hits it, because they're very loud on their walking, every time the shoulder hits it, it makes the saddle go forward. Dave, we, we, we got some information on the website, on the web, on the, uh, on the website on breast collars and it talks about it. And uh, we could probably give them some information and go there and watch it, physically watch it. But basically what he has learned now, that ho his horse breast collar on my saddle, my Steve Edwards saddle, notice I didn't say mule saddle, on my Steve Edwards saddle, it pulled the saddle forward. 
he's been fighting it and fighting it for pretty much all his life, you know, with these mules. And now he used my breast collar, it fixed the problem. Now, the good thing about it too, he was also able to take his breast collars that are built the same way almost, that follow the slope of the shoulder. That's what you want your breast collars to do. Follow the slope of the shoulder, not go out at a Y, uh, like, like you see saddles do like this. Don't do that, okay? Because, because what happens every time the shoulder hits that mule's breast collar, it's gonna bring the saddle forward every time. So follow the slope of the shoulder up. Now your worst breast collar out there is your pulling collar. Pulling collars, that's where they're attached hard and fast to the pummel. You have two straps and it comes down. That one pulls the saddle not only down toward the animal, but it pulls it forward at the same time. So anyway, there you are. He's, I'm, I'm glad he was happy and he sent us that note. And folks, we love it. Love it when you send out notes and say, hey, we, you know, we've been doing this all our lives and now we found out that, yep, that mule is different than that horse. Why don't you tell me about one or two cowboys who are real big influences on you? Oh, influences. I can look up here. One of these times I'll have to show you the pictures, but I can see Delos Burke setting up here. It's, an, it's a print of uh, him setting on his first mule. Uh, I've got a book over here that he, he wrote. And this man, I mean, these people, they did this for a living. It wasn't just they got fluffy to go up and down the trail with. Uh, these animals meant something to them. They had to have them to make them go. So Delos Burke, Nick West, uh, incredible uh, men that have done this for a living in, in Alberta, uh, around Red Deer, around Sundry. I've got a pair of shaps hanging up over here that belongs to uh, Bud Brown. One of these times I'll have to, we'll have to do a little series and I'll show you these things. Uh, just mementos that I've had that I just had these guys. I named, I've got a bunkhouse down below in the part of the ranch and one half of it is kind of small and I call it the Delos Burke because Delos was just kind of a small guy and the big, the two bedroom uh, bunkhouse that we rent out is uh, Nick West. And Nick was famous for his rawhide work. Uh, that's something else I'll have to show you sometime is show you the the rawhide work, the, the braided nose bands, the hobbles and ropes. I got ropes that he's made. Uh, and, and, and Bud Brown, he's, uh, he's history here in, in Arizona. I mean, anybody that, anybody, you, anytime you mention Bud Brown, you think of Bud Brown's barn. It used to be a great place to go eat and listen to, to cowboy music. And, uh, and he was known for long line driving. He took in, 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 in uh, when we had a 200 year centennial, he drove from Arizona to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania with a six up of mules on a, on a wagon. Incredible, you know. You wanna talk real quick? We had a question come in from Cheryl on Facebook and she's ac asking about the correct placement, the correct tacking of a breast collar for a mule. Any pointers for Cheryl as she's starting to uh, to get this uh, animal fitted out? You bet. One thing you want to remember, Cheryl, is that mules are very lateral when they're walking. So every time that shoulder hits that breast collar, it's saying to the saddle, stay here. The downside of this is that mules are V-shaped in their shoulders. And if you're using a horse breast collar where it attaches into rings in the saddle, or a pulling collar, which is the worst one, that attaches, attaches up in the pummel, anything that's attached hard and fast is going to pull that saddle forward. So if you, we've got a link we could probably send you on where I talked about breast collars and showed how mine worked. Mine is attached into the pummel, but if you look at it with the strap attached around the horn, and as the breast collar moves back and forth, it gives with the animal. The only time it's going to pull on that saddle is if I'm dragging a calf to the fire or I'm going up a hill. So if I'm dragging something or going up a hill, then it works. But if you're using a pulling collar, that is the worst collar you can do. And you want it to fit right along the shape of the neck, right along the shape of the neck. If you do a flat one, it's going to inhibit the shoulders. And if you do the one that goes over to the D-rings, you're going to inhibit the shoulders. And you'll even watch your mule where they get tired of the pain and pressure. They'll start short striding, getting to follow up underneath themselves in the front of him. 
Yeah, yeah going back to the way that mules display their discomfort, mules display mules display the things that are causing them pain. It's it's subtle in a lot of cases, but it's it's very real. And so, yeah, it's a it's a pretty cool thing at the at the um why does my mule do that clinic last month? Um, you did, you, you, you demonstrated your breast collar and the way that it works. And, and I, I don't know all the terminology, but yeah, it's, it's really crazy. So on the saddle in the front where is that the pummel? Is that what that's called? Yes. So there's a, there's, there's the pummel, but there's a, a little gap down here. And so you tie a little strap and then the yes. breast collar comes around. And so, th- you know, this is the strap right here and it goes inside of that. And so as they move back and forth, that strap or that breast collar can slide back and forth. And you demonstrated it right in front of folks. And I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, that's brilliant. Like that just makes sense because you don't want that thing pulling back and forth, back and forth, causing all that pain. So yeah, we do have a video of that because I just recorded it. So I'll make sure that we get that up on YouTube so folks can see uh, because it really is, it really is a, uh, it's like a neat little trick. Honestly, that's how I feel about it. When I watch it, it's a neat little trick that uh, that does something really awesome for the animal. Um, let's see. And Dave, we might also mention there, yeah. it's imperative you have both a breeching and breast collar because what happens is, is going down the trail, your senses do loosen up. And if you have a properly adjusted breeching and breast collar, when the cinches loosen up, the breeching and breast collars keep that saddle into place. And and it's it's imperative that you have it there. Next question. This one comes in from Rebecca. Says, uh, bought a, let's see. Oh, goodness. Bought a mule on an auction site. We've heard that before. She goes, yeah, I know. He is four and I want to start him over from scratch as he has a few bad habits I've seen already. First and foremost being... Uh, he does not respect the lead rope. I have bought the come along and the halter am, and am winding how, wondering how you can even get it on them. He panics in a small area, so not safe to rot, to stall him and do it as well as very head shy. I've started him in a larger pin where he doesn't feel trapped and am working on step one. Basic, go up and touch him on the shoulder and back away. He is super herd bound and I have him with two mares I can control well. What advice would you give to Rebecca? Number one, get him away from the mares. Don't ever, folks, don't do this. Don't put your mule in a a stall with a bunch of other animals, let alone mares. They become super subservient to a mare. Super subservient. They'll jump over a cliff for a mare, yeah that bad. So anytime you're going to train, anytime you're in foundational training, the mule, the donkey must imperative, must be in a 20 by 20 stall. That way they can keep their mind on life. It's important. You put them out with a bunch of other animals, you're gonna lose everything you had just done, guaranteed. You're going to see it time again, time again. Now, if you walk up and touch the shoulder, how many times have you done that now? Okay. I hope you've done it three, six, nine, twelve, and then you're done. Here's the problem, folks, is we overdo it. We're not building a foundation. You want to build a foundation. I walk up three times. I touch the shoulder. The third time is better than the first time. On the near side, the left-hand side, I'm done. Then I go to the offside and I walk up to it three times. I'm done. Okay. My preference would be you get a come along hitch on that mule right away. Folks, a lot of you can, can use a, a metal gate and with a rope on it. And you tie the rope to the metal gate, have somebody to be able to, when you, once you kind of run the mule into that gate area, swing the gate over closed and use that rope to tie off to a good post. Now you've got a squeeze chute. Now you can do what you want to do. But my preference is have a round pin, have the corral, run your round, run your, your mule from your corral into the alley in, into the round pin. Now again, don't overdo it. Three, six, nine, twelve. Today, I'm going to do three times with the mule going around to counterclockwise. 
and clockwise three times. That's what I'm going to do. By doing it three to the right, three to the left, there I'm starting to build a foundation. Next time I train, three to the right, three to the left, plus I add three more to the right and left. Now I'm building a foundation. You all see it? The problem is when we're training, we tend to overdo it. Oh, we're doing good. Let's keep on going. No, 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 no. Quit. Quit. Don't keep going. Because if you keep going, you're not building a foundation. You're going to blow their mind. Yes, you are. Build a foundation. Go slow. Okay. Uh, so that would be my preference. You can get in around PM and then get their feet to stop. That makes a big difference. And then it, there's more to it than we we can do a six hour show on round pin work. Signs of your cinch being too tight. And where this comes from is uh, we, we posted a, po a picture on Facebook. Steve, you'll know what I'm talking about. This picture of, uh, of um, uh, white hairs and cinches being too tight and scalding and things of that nature. And uh, we had uh, John on Facebook say, hey, are the are the signs of this scalding the uh, cinches being too tight? Are they, they are they the same on a horse as they are on a mule? Do I look for the same thing? Um, so you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. You've got an equine. You've got hair follicles. White hairs are from a scald, folks. They're they're not they're they're from us overheating our animal. Look, when you take a break, you take a break with your horse or your mule or your donkey. Loosen up your cinches, raise up the back of your saddle, shake it up and down, let some cool air go through there, even with my saddle pad. Let me ask you something. If you've got a wool pad on and it's during the summertime, do you wear wool during the summertime? Answer, and no. You wear wool to be warm. If you've ever been in a wetsuit, a rubber wetsuit, you know not only are you wet, when you come out of that suit, but you're also warm and you've been in, in a cold water. So <laughs> I have people all the time saying, oh, that, that rubber, you know, we'll call them. No, it don't. You know, it absolutely don't. If, if, it's, if it's done properly, that will work good. But yes, on a horse, you've got hair follicles. And notice on your horses, folks, the white spots is almost identical, the same place as it on a mule, okay? That's because they only tighten the front cinch and there's no back cinch. The front cinch on, on a horse must be tight. Back cinch on a horse must be snug. Because otherwise, the saddle cantilevers and where does the pressure go? Right here's the 6th and 7th rib on a horse. Runs horizontal. But right in behind that area, when you tighten that front cinch, it restricts that muscle and tendon area. Period. So Kevin has a uh, has a follow up question. He says, "Can the cinch, cinch be too long as long as it isn't hitting the pad?" Yes, that's too long. It's way too long. Uh, it, the the cinch it makes no difference where your D rings are, as long as the cinch comes up and it and is just about with the rib cage. So I'm going to tell you, you know, 12 to 14 inches is a pretty good length from D ring to D ring. Some cinches have D-rings that go right against the animal, and that's okay as long as it's tightened correctly. My cinches are made with a padding so that the D-ring don't touch. But I've had people, as a matter of fact, I'm going to see uh, uh, a friend of mine up in, uh, in, in Wyoming next, uh, next month when I'll be up in Gillette, mm -hmm. Wyoming. Uh, and he's got a view. He says, Steve, look what your saddle done. It's got this white spot. No, no, it's the D-ring, <laughs> and the D-ring rubbed on the fat pocket of that mule. I remember the mule well when I was there, and it's that high spot of fat pocket. We can't take that away, okay? That high spot is there, and when that D-ring rubs on it, we kill the hair follicles, and we get the white spots. White spots are from a skull. Um, my donkey puts his head down when I ride him. I have a four-year-old donkey, and when I ride him, he always puts his nose almost to the ground. I'm not sure why. I have all of Steve's tech, and I make sure it doesn't interfere with the shoulders. He's trying to tell me something, but I'm not sure what. I cannot ride him this way. Do you have any thoughts? Well, of course, my first thought is, you know, you've done the dental work, and that's done. You've done the chiropractic work, and that's done. 
it could be that some of these, I've had donkeys do that. They have to build up their confidence. And I've had some of them go a long time uh, and do this. So what I usually do is I take my hands on the reins on the snaffle bit and I take and I bump right, left, right, left, and I pull, I bump up and I make their nose being down uncomfortable. So I see it as two things. One, it can be that the, that the mule is uh, evading you and that's the way he can do it. The other one, it could be his loss, loss of confidence. Uh, so which can happen. Now, a little test. When the, when the mule has a rider on it, does he put his head down? When the mule doesn't have a rider on it and you lead it, does he put his head down? So, uh, I've seen it both ways. I see it where I put a small rider on, on the donkey's back, he's comfortable with that. When you put a bigger rider on the donkey's back, he's uncomfortable with that and he drops his head. So, I'd almost have to see it in motion, but there's some thoughts for you. So I went and I found, he sent this in on Facebook and, and I did not see this until just now. After I grabbed the question and I put it in my list, he wrote uh, back, he said, I had a vet check the teeth for point and there weren't any. He doesn't have wolf's teeth. I can saddle him and send you pics. We'll definitely want that. Um, not sure why he keeps his head so low. It's almost like he's sniffing the ground. He is really pulling, uh, he is, he, it, he is really pulling, he, but head super low. Um, I have to keep pulling his head up. Um, and then I think this is unrelated, but I'll just read it anyways. He goes, I purchased a double twisted snaffle from Steve. I have a thin four-year-old donkey and it appears too large for him. It sticks out the sides of the mouth. Are there different sizes? I have saddle pad, britchin, bir uh, berths, and the training double twisted snaffle bit. Um, when I got the bit, I didn't really ask for size. So I, we already talked about sizing for a bit. So I'll go back to that. And it sounds like the rest of this is unrelated, but yeah. Yeah, uh, about the teeth. Doesn't have wolf teeth, so I can saddle him. I think we're just going to want pictures, yeah? Yeah, I want pictures. But the other thing, remember a snaffle bit can be this long, and then when you pull on the sides, it can be shorter. So it makes no difference really how it's setting in here unless it's real long. I mean, if it's sticking out an inch on each side, that's different. If it's sticking out, uh, oh, maybe like a, a quarter inch, mm -hmm. To maybe a half at the most, that's okay. Uh, but it's the big thing is their lips. But go back. Uh, did the vet actually float the teeth, or did he say they were okay? So that would bother me. These vets all the time are saying, "Well, he'll be fine. Take that upper and lower, move it back and forth, and listen for yourself." I can't tell you how many people have told me their vet said they were fine, and they were not. You know. Patty chimes in. She says, my mule isn't tripping, but his heels are turning in. What would you say about heels that are turning in? Well, heels that are turning in, Patty, are contracted heels. And that's the problem. You see, we, we think we can, we can ride the mule and keep the mule with, without shoeing them. You see, when those heels, here's the heels, when they start coming in, that's called contraction. And when you get contraction of the heel, that means your frog's going to be small. Folks, it's imperative. You know, you don't have to keep them shod all the time. But if you don't, don't shoe them properly, those heels are going to come in. Don't listen to folks that say you don't have to shoe your mule. You're better. Now, by the way, Dave, I've got a friend. Uh, remember uh, 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 Jeff Kinney from Globe? Mm -hmm. he, he's got a, a mule and his heels are severely contracted. So I would like to shoot some video for YouTube and for other people uh, so that people can see what you do to fix that. It's, it's probably the, the biggest uh, uh, structural problem we have with our meals. So if they're contracted, Patty, get that meal to a farrier that knows how to do uh, uh, shoeing that is going to be responsive to fixing it. Now, I would be happy to talk to any shoer, tell them how to fix it. But usually if, uh, if they're a, a good farrier, they know how to fix a contracted heel.
girl. You can tell them how pretty you are, hey? Yeah, it's a good girl. You got enough, done? Thanks. You got enough video done?